us as spec geeks working on this stuff, we don't have to bifurcate our efforts. We can take the energies from both teams and now combine them and work in a single unified direction, which is huge for all of you guys. A, in that it makes a better spec, and B, in that the number of vendors who will be able to support this to provide you truly innovative tools should be greatly enhanced. Casper, does this mean that the two standards will actually merge or will there be two branches? Maybe it's better that I try and answer this. So, uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds on the technical stuff because I'm, I'm going to guess there's a whole lot of other people who are like, I don't get what you're even saying already now, right? <laughs> so, uh, to, to answer your question though, Casper, remember that the Experience API is, and I call it the Experience API because that's its official name through ADL and we're the USDOD, so we're really good about branding things all the time, right? Um, <laughs> And, but all of you guys know is it's tin can because that's what we started calling it at the beginning, which is why you all know it. Anyway, so the Experience API, Casper, um, is one technology that will be in the huge portfolio of technologies that we consider to be the training and learning architecture. Okay. What we think CMI5 is going to be is an extension of the Experience API. Right. So it's technically the same spec they're going to add on features for their community practice and based on the requirements that they give us in terms of the things that it doesn't do right now that would support their use cases we're going to do what we whatever we have to do to help make sure that that happens okay so help make sense okay cool all right i want to go to a completely non-technical question stephanie how you doing um what would you do with it going to change the way that myself as a designer is are able to create learning experiences that are beyond what we currently have. So right now when you think about a learning experience it's typically a course either instructor led or e-learning and it's not those little snippets of information that a learner needs when they need it and they don't have a lot of choices in where they go. So for me it opens up just a huge world of providing experiences for the learners and being able to track those and watch those and see where the trends are and help the business understand where some of the gaps in the learning are and also to create additional learning, things that I may not have thought about. So really, I now have thousands of designers who are helping me create experiences and it's a way for me to capture it. So it, to me, it's an exciting new way of, of creating those experiences for the learner and it goes beyond training. It's not training. It's about providing experiences for the learners that teach them and have them learn something new, what they want to learn, when they want to learn it, and how they want to learn it. So I think it's a really exciting way of thinking. It's like thinking in the future. I'm going to ask Julie, the fabulous Julie Dirksen here, to follow up with that. So Julie, Stephanie talks about learning experiences, and we've heard a lot of buzz this year, and even last year, about learning experiences. What the hell does that really mean? <laughs> learning experience. What does learning experiences mean? Um, uh, we we're fundamentally seeing a shift in the industry because until fairly recently, it's been good enough to be good providers of information. Um, in a lot of cases. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who does service design. He was talking about how um, libraries and museums, he works a lot with libraries and museums, and he talks about how their role used to be as kind of the holders of the receptacles of information. And um, that's changing because now if you want you know, the history of Las Vegas, you do not need to go to the museum to get the history of Las Vegas. So what's the value proposition of those, of those um, uh, organizations now that it's not about being kind of the holder of information. It needs to be about what kinds of experiences do you have, how do you understand things, how do you have kind of, um, how can you have a visceral understanding of what it means to have, you know, been around 100 years ago or, you know, different kinds of things. And I think that that same thing is going to confront us as an industry because there's been a lot of, 
e-learning that's really just information provide, you know, providing of information. And that is going to be increasingly devalued in the next few years as we go along. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what's our value proposition? If everybody's got access to the information that they need all the time, what are we doing for learners? What are we doing for people? And if we aren't thinking about what our experiences that are going to help people get up to speed much faster than they might otherwise, or experiences that are going to help change some of those difficult and tractable behaviors, or help people develop real deep expertise, those kinds of things. And one of the problems with that is that um, kind of the older standards were good at sort of here's my box of information, did my box of information get looked at, you know. But if we're going to have more experiences for our learners, we're going to need to be able to kind of go back and forth. Like you did this, so I'm going to have you do that, you know, I'm going to feed you this, or you're going to have this, and you're going to go there. And without that kind of information feedback loop between what they're doing and what you can provide to them next and how they need to go places, without a good feedback loop around that stuff, then you don't really, you know, you're, you know, you're going to basically be doing that stuff blind, and that's what we're trying to hopefully fix, I guess, right? Okay, sorry for being late, I was driving in on the traffic. No, it's okay. I'm, we're just glad you're here. So, Clark, I'm going to sit down because now we're going to talk seriously. Also, because I'm tired. Um, are we full of crap? <laughs> <laughs> No, but you're not there yet. <laughs> I mean, to build on what Julie was saying, um, to me, learning is not about connecting to information. It can be, but really learning is about action and reflection. And what Tin Can does is starts talking about learning as activities instead of content. Now, just registering activity by itself, I did this, isn't much more helpful than I exposed you to this content, the old generation. But if we start saying this sequence of activities is a path to competency and the ability to recommend that, to track that, then we're beginning to start talking about meaningful learning. It's an opportunity to go forward. There's more needed on top of this, but the recognition that activity is important and not exposure to content you know, content at the right moment can be good, and we spend a lot of time creating those contexts, but let's start talking about the full activity, not just the exposure to content, and that's what I think we have the building block for now that we didn't have before, and that's why I think it's interesting. So, if we're not there yet, why should anybody do it? You've got to have the foundation. Um, why should everybody do it? Because you need that foundation. You need the ability to track those, to build the layers on top of it. If you don't have the foundation, everything else you do is, it doesn't have any basis. If we don't have a dream of where we want to go, it's going to be really hard to create Tin Can in that, or the Experience API in that direction. It's like, you know, Avatar. He didn't have, he didn't know how it was going to be done, but he knew what he wanted done. And I think we kind of have to take that same mindset. We need to know what we want done, we just don't know how we're going to get there. And I think that with the Experience API, we can help drive where that should go if we have a vision of where we want it to be. If we don't have that vision, then where is it going to go? And are we going to end up with something that's not going to do us any good? So it's creating that futuristic, don't worry about how we're going to get there. Let's worry about where we want to go. I just want to add one thing. I mean, think about it. it it's not just exposure to content. What if we said, go out and interview this person. Go out and do this task. All those can be what, what a mentor would recommend as a learning path. We need a way to be able to, to codify that, to recommend it, to track it, to identify it. And increasingly, I'm hoping the opportunity will be for communities of practice to start defining their own paths to competency and create those and track them. And, and having a common standard and reference format is a really important component of that. So a di different perspective on the follow-up of that from kind of a personal reflection is Tin Can enables a lot of these things. But Tin Can in itself doesn't build any of them. 
Take care of the foundation upon which many things can be built. It lays the groundwork for all kinds of new tools to start to emerge. And what has me really excited isn't really what's there today. And if you tin can in and of itself, it's it's plumbing. It's not sexy. It's just how we move data around. But plumbing and foundations and standards allow us to build things on top of them. Uh, Tin can's going to, uh, if you look at the e-learning industry 12 years ago, before SCORM, weren't that many tools out there. Because if you built a tool, you didn't have a market, you couldn't go out and sell it to many places. Every time you sold it, you had to customize it. Now that we have a standard, there's thousands of e-learning vendors, literally thousands of e-learning vendors out there who publish to SCORM or consume SCORM and play in this marketplace. Tin can has now expanded the type and number of vendors who can participate in that marketplace and unlocked a world of innovation and some just no-brainer stuff like I mentioned before that other industries are, are doing yesterday and we have struggled to adopt. So uh, I guess I'll go up and down the, the chain here. Um, oh, oh, I guess I won't. There's a question. No, no, no. Your questions are more important than my. Your questions are more important than my silly questions. So. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Uh, okay, so not being part of the process when there was nothing, jumping to scorn, and now we're going from scorn to infinite possibilities. It is a huge paradigm shift. What are the challenges? We're going to, how can we make that jump? How can we bridge the two right now? Because this is phenomenal, but how are we going to put our arms around it? Because we have to go back to our corporations, our businesses, and sell this. But at the same time, we're, we're at where we're at today. What are some of the things that you would suggest or point out or the growing pains? So like, we, like next year, where are we going to be at? You all here if I just start talking? Okay. So, so, where to start? Within an organization, where do you start? Um, the first thing I would probably say is there's, start small. We had our uh, breakfast bright session that we just came from where we started talking about people and their problems. Uh, you know, we try to say, hey, how is this going to impact your organization? I've had that conversation a dozen times here at DevLearn, and every Everybody that I've talked to has, everybody in this organization has something they want to do, but they just can't. It's just, they're kind of stuck. Maybe they want to put content learning on a mobile device, and they're stuck. Maybe they want to share data across systems, and that just can't happen. Um, I would look to find those little things and get a small win first. From a standards evangelism perspective, and we announced the Tin Can API at mLearn DevCon because we thought that mobile would be the <clears throat> one simple, easy thing that everybody wants to do that they can't do right now. And Tin Can's going to solve that problem. Knowing that if we got people to adopt it for mobile, then all of a sudden they can start using it for all of these other things. And I would take a similar approach within an organization to say, let's, let's do one thing, lay that foundation to do other things as well. And I, I think the second part of that conversation is, where are we going to be in a year? Um, so let's see, this is October, and this was released in June to the public. And we now have, how many is it, 30? Something vendors? We had four more, four or five more this week while it actually was going on. So we have like 30 Call it 30 vendors who have already adopted Tin Can. Um, we have had hundreds and hundreds of conversations with more who are interested. And so a year from now, we'll have the spec formula released in the spring. And I suspect we will probably triple the number of vendors who have actually included support for this, which means you can start to buy stuff and start to really be using it. There'll be tools out there. There's some great tools right now to go ahead and start using it, but they're going to be widespread. I think you're going to start to see some real organizations relying heavily on Tin Can for the, the work they're doing in the real world. And um, I think that's when you're going to see the, the growth curve really start to, to spike up. 
In terms of other things that you can do, one of the things that I think is really important too is to kind of um, push the boundaries of what's possible with it. Because uh, right now, you know, there's, there's, you know, you can kind of record learning events and that's great. But there's, I think that the really interesting stuff is going to come when people start kind of hacking um, the, the tin can. Because basically you're like, ah, oh, I got pipes. Now I can, I can use it for plumbing, but I could also use it for, you know, other kinds of liquids, um, but terrible analogy. Sorry, it's early. Um, uh, anyway, but one of the things um, I, I've been thinking a lot about lately are feedback loops because when you, how many people have ever done classroom training? Yeah, so lots of people have done classroom training. When you do classroom training, you get a lot of feedback about how you're doing. Anybody ever not like tweak something after they taught a class for the first time? Like, everybody not ever kind of, you know, said, okay, that worked, that didn't work, this worked really well, this I need to change, this, you know, I need to tweak. So we have this great feedback loop when you're actually in front of your learners and seeing how they're reacting to things and stuff like that. And we've had kind of a fundamentally broken feedback loop in e-learning because stuff gets loaded up on the LMS and that's frequently the last that anybody ever sees of it. And so you're not seeing that people totally ignored that piece of text over on this page and you're not seeing that, um, you know, uh, everybody kind of clicked the four wrong things before they finally figured out where they were supposed to be working and all of that kind of stuff. And so that's one of the potential things that you can do with Tin Can is start kind of having that same kind of rich feedback loop that you get when you're dealing with learners in person but in a, in a virtual environment. And there's gonna, it's going to be different a little bit, but it has the potential to really, I think, push us forward as a whole industry if we can start getting that kind of feedback on the work that we're doing so that we can feed that back in and improve it going forward. Um, now, one of the important things and one of my big concerns with Team Can is that as vendors implement it, they're going to define narrowly what, you, what kind of data you can collect in it. And so that's one of the things I would definitely encourage people to do is to kind of keep the pressure on, you know, your LMS vendor or your, um, uh, you know, your authoring tools vendors about making sure that you've got a lot of control over what you'll be able to do with Team Can and that it isn't just sort of set little prescribed you know, you've got, you can choose from one of six tin can statements. No, we want to have a lot more flexibility than that because we don't even know what we're going to be able to do in terms of data that we're going to be able to collect on this and how that's going to change our ability to be really, um, you know, great and amazing e-learning designers. So. I want to finish answering that question and then, um, because uh, it strikes me there's one very big thing you want to start doing differently. I, I love the opportunity to start tracking all sorts of activities and data mining and the analytics that may come out of that, finding out that this person did that and succeeded and this person did something else and didn't succeed so we can start mining and finding out what's working and what's not. But the thing that t is most exciting to me about this is to stop thinking about content delivery as the way to develop people. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. And so you can start just creating, thinking about creating learning experiences that include much more, that start getting distributed across time and space, the opportunities with mobile. But to start saying, you know, do this and do this and do this and say that as a learning, to start creating a much richer and allowing people to, to make some choice about what they do as part of their learning path and tracking that and not just have it totally tied to content delivery. So I guess my suggestion is start thinking much rich in much richer ways about how you might develop people's learning and realize you'll have a mechanism to track it. I want to go here the And what Clark just said is very much related to my question or comment, and that is, is anyone working on the impact of TinCan on design? Because we're talking about, you know, plumbing and this, that, and the other thing, and you know, the technology is great, but if the design ain't there. Uh, uh, yes and no. So in other words, I've been trying to find ways to represent a learning path that is not content centric. So I've started trying to think about activity, sequence of activities being a curriculum, not a series of content being a curriculum. And I still, I think we're still somewhat wrestling with what an instructional design or learning design might be that's a, that's a much richer suite of possibilities. Um, I'm not sure we're quite there, but one of the things we have to recognize is that dumping a mass of stuff, whether it's activity or not, in one short period of time that's been our typical learning experience, doesn't lead to any meaningful change. It dissipates so quickly, we have to space it out over time. And this is one way we can start looking at that. <laughs> 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 um, 
Oh, so the impact of tin can on design. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I, I really think it is a, it's a fundamental shift because we don't even know what we can do with it yet. Um, uh, so the answer is yes, thinking about what we can do with the design. It's, it's going to help us do some things that we want to do right now but are hard to do, but also as we sort of develop with it, there's going to be all sorts of things that we didn't even know we wanted to do that we'll be able to do with it. Um, which is, I realize, a little bit of a hedge. Yes, yes thinking about it, <laughs> working on that question. Just, just to follow up. What brought this to mind was the comment earlier about um, mentoring. It may well be that instructional designers in their traditional role will have nothing to do with this. Nothing. Because if you were talking about mentoring, it's not going to be the instructional designer that's the mentor. It's the instructional designer who has to figure out how to set up a system that will get those things to happen. In other words, you're not going to be, we are not going to be writing a big grand plan that says A, B, C, D, E. We need to figure out a way to cause that to happen or to facilitate its happening. I don't know the answer, but we, we need to find it. <coughs> um, I want to bookmark this conversation. I know there's a question up here that's been a very patient waiting for it, but I want to come back to this particular topic. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the thing with the question, which I have when I bring it back to my team, is who needs to know about it? Because I have a developer who is not a trainer. He is from, he builds websites, and like, he's extremely good at it. So I'm, I've been challenged. He asked me, he goes, well, why do we need Swarm? And I'm like, because of those two buttons, the exit submit and the exit is suspended. It tells the LMS what to do. And I also have a young 19-year-old designer who is in developing in our industry. I've been in the industry for 19 years to still figure out what SCORE means and all that. So when I go back to my team and I challenge my, design, my developer, who in the team needs to know about Team Canada? And I understand from an instructional designer, you need to know it to challenge your mind where to go. And in the second second fold, who needs to know to practically get it done uh, on my team? Like, Team Can for me as a designer, or like when I'm doing animations, I just need to know what's there. But I just want on my team to figure out to get it done and done. So do I go back to my programmer and say, you need to research as much as you can on experience API and think can to see where it's going? Because you need to figure it out for me. And that's what I, that's what my struggle is, is a lot of people in the room I know are just becoming uh, designers of their own build their own content, push it to movie like, but API to me is that hardcore developer aspect that I don't want to ever know. <laughs> and can I ask you that when you answer that question, if you can talk about the skills that are required in terms of the people that would need to know? Well, I'm going to answer the question about who needs to know. Everybody needs to know. It's just the different degrees that you need to know and how you're going to apply it. So you really truly need to have a team because I don't think anybody can, because it's so new, nobody's going to be able to know the technical part of it and how to implement it and know how to figure out how to design it for people and figure out you know where we're going to go in the future. I think you've got to have everybody on your team knowing something about Tin Can and being experts in different areas of Tin Can in order to make it successful. I'm going to answer that question a little bit differently and say, you said you had a young instructional designer who has no experience. God bless you, that's the perfect scenario for this. She has no, he or she has no constraints over <clears throat> the box we've been in. Let them go imagine, let them go do whatever the heck they want to do for a great instructional experience and be unconstrained. Then when your developer gets stuck implementing it and has to go you know, put this stuff into in, into a, a LMS, he's got to go weed through some, some technical spec and know how to shuffle some, some bits and bytes around. For many of you in your organizations, it's more about generating the awareness of what is now possible to remove that box that you've been in for the last 10 years. That's, that's the big thing. Ideally, remember this is plumbing, this is tools, this is a standard. When standards are working well, they disappear. There's a lot of effort that went into the standard for that plug on the wall so that anything you plug into it will work. And when they were first making that, I'm sure there was all kinds of grand panels talking about how we're going to be able to plug anything into the wall now, and that's gonna, that changed the world. It did. The stuff you can do now is dramatically different, but we don't think about it anymore. And that's the way to should be, just be in the background of your tools. I'll, I'll wait in here and try and get it a little bit more nuts to bolts here. 
the skills you need as a front end developer for what would you might consider content. Um, you need to be able to make web service calls from something, whether you're building a web page, whether you're building a web app, whether you're building a mobile app, whether you are embedding some kind of call, you know, some kind of recording in some kind of interaction that's within your performance management system or your supply chain management system or whatever it is. I want people to think about this when I say these things very carefully. It isn't just about training anymore. You can embed what we're tin can API, you know, calls that record a person's activity in your organization. You could probably embed them in lots of different systems, and what that gives you now is a holistic picture of what that employee is doing and how that how their how their activity ties to performance. And that is a very different scenario than what than just talking about that somebody completed this course in this amount of time. What's the what's the vision for selecting the verbs? That's that's my question because I think that's where it all come, comes down to me because that's what opens everything up. It's not just completed anymore. It's read a book. It's highlighted this. It's done this. It's done that. What's the vision on that? And because I think that's where this group could be probably the most helpful. Uh, well, all right. So initially, we had a. I didn't need to be talking so much. Anyway, um, initially, initially, when we started out uh, with thinking, we had a very constrained vocabulary that was based largely on the kinds of things that we had already been doing with SCORM and a few other things that we kind of recognized from the the specification that inspired this effort, which was uh, activity streams, uh, which is something that Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Jive and MySpace. I unbelievably MySpace does stuff. And I keep saying that, but it's true. Um, uh, um, and what we found very quickly at MLearnCon when we launched with uh, the, the, the 12 vendors who had developed stuff for it, with it, to play with it, uh, was that the vocabulary that we had predefined was very limiting for them. They wanted to describe what was learning in lots of ways. Um, and the challenge that came with that was, well, how do you deal with that? So what's happening, the, the, the solution that we're going with right now is that you can now extend the vocabulary to be defined in lots of ways. We're creating a registry of verbs to be able to be used. And, you know, the, the ins and outs of how you define a verb are really quite loose. You have, as long as you have a definition that can be tied to some kind of URI or some kind of URL link, um, it could be a plain text definition. I mean, there's nothing really nothing more to it than that. Just so that if, if there's a system that needs to ever do a lookup of what that verb is supposed to mean, that there's something there that resolves it that something can make sense of. For now, I think it'll get more complex. But along with more complexity, will become will there will be solutions that evolve with it. You know, I think that's the nature of the beast that we're playing with. Yes. Mel Clarell, thanks for uh, the panel, by the way, the discussion. Uh, so I'm trying, still trying to wrap my head around this, and you guys are helping define that a little bit more. But let me give you a use case. So maybe we have a, a, an organization. Well, my organization, we have our customers. They download our software, and we'd like to ramp them up to use our so you know, be able to use our software a lot faster, you know, shorten that learning curve. Okay. So there's different ways they interact with our organization. They can call in and. Uh, open a trouble ticket through a contact form on a web page. They can call in, leave a voicemail. Uh, the contact form and the voicemail all goes in our salesforce.com. So that's an activity in there. And then that interacts with our support group. Our support group picks that up and tries to identify some training that we can do live with them through webinars. But customers can also access web-based training that isn't in an LMS. And at the same time, our internal staff uses an LMS to understand different features of our products. Give me a use case on how Tin Can, uh, how a training program can leverage Tin Can internally to ramp up the un our customers' understanding of how to use our software faster. This is a great question because I have a feeling that you're going to find out that there's a whole lot of ways this should be done, and I'm just going to go up down the down the trail. Um, so, in terms of ramping up um, and software development and things like that, uh, there's 
Um, I was seeing an interesting example using help pages the other day, but I think you could do it on the training side, which is really, uh, it was, I was talking to somebody who was using Google Analytics on all of their help resource pages. And so she knew immediately where people were on, you know, these are the resource pages that people access all the time. These are the research pages that nobody ever accesses. And so being able to kind of, if you're doing kind of a software training piece or something like that, and being able to say, these are the screens where, you know, people are spending a hell of a lot of time and seem to really not be kind of understanding or struggling if you've got a simulation or something like that, versus this is the stuff that people are breezing through and are barely like blinking. You know, you might actually sort of take that and say, all right, if I do a new iteration of the training, I'm actually going to really dial down on the stuff that nobody's having any trouble with. You know, make sure it's still covered, but kind of as minimally as possible, and expand out the pieces that somebody is having, you know, that they do seem to be having trouble with, that they're just struggling. Or I can have it tracked out of these resource pages, and that tells me that I've got a gap over here in terms of everybody keeps going and hitting the same resource page, and so I've got a problem. And, you know, the other part of it is it's not only going to fix your training, it may tell you where you've got issues in your software as well. I was talking to somebody who was asking me yesterday if you could use Tin Can for usability data, and I'm like, yeah, probably. Um, you know, I think that there's just a lot of different applications we're not even sort of speculating about yet. So my, my answer would be very similar. The Tin Can provides an opportunity to bring in data from the many sources you mentioned to do the analytics on it. I, I want to nitpick, um, pick on you a little bit there for a second to make a point. You, know, you, you asked the question, how can Tin Can help me or help my users get their so learn the software better? And so the nitpick is going to be, Tin Can is not going to improve your training. Tin Can will provide you the ability to deliver training in new ways. It will provide you the ability to bring data about that training in and of itself. But, you know, Tin Can's that, it's the, it's the geeky yeah. stuff, the plumbing under the hood. There's a lot of, you know, it's not going to be a substitute for good instructional design and content activities. <laughs> I'm not done yet. Um, I want to, uh, fortunately they didn't bring this up so I get to. Um, one of the other things you, you potentially will have the capability of doing it is having looked at that person's record who calls you up or who needs help right now and know what they have done. So you can customize what you give to them because this person has seen, already seen X and Y so I only need to show them Z. Or this person hasn't and so I need to give them more. But you will be able to know more about what they've done, what they've tried, what they haven't tried and be able to, by a set of rules, optimize what you might serve up to them. Um, you know, in addition to beginning to mine data about this overall and finding what's working and what's not, and there's a lot of stuff, but you'd be able to use that information proactively to start optimizing what you serve to people is another opportunity, as well as looking at perhaps a richer picture of what might develop them. It's not just content and simulations. Maybe it's going off reading this, it's watching this video, whatever. Yes, and. But I'm also going to nitpick what Mike nitpicked. So, Hold on a second, I'll get the nitpick down. You can nitpick me later, okay? So, so uh, what I love about this is that we finally have a use case that we're talking about that we can actually kind of like, like start picking apart and, and, and playing with. Um, I would argue that Tin can, can improve your instructional design because the same data that is, that is being generated in the design of whatever, you know, all the different ways in which people can interface with your organization in order to learn, you know, how to use your software. That provides you a feedback loop too in terms of usability and user analytics and understanding like how they're using X as door services. What so what you know who in your organization is actually providing them, you know, you know, valuable information that you know doesn't require them to go other in other avenues. But you know, what are the user flows in terms of accessing the things that they need to know? And I would argue because it hasn't been brought up yet, these you could build into the actual software Tin can calls that demonstrate like how they're actually using the software. So if you're recognizing that there are features or functionality that they're not using, then maybe that black hole of activity, because you can see what they're doing, but you can also see then all the things that they're not doing because there's just no data being generated from those those activities. And if that's the case, that might indicate to you that 
maybe that's something that needs to be, you know, the, the design of how that is presented or the design of how people can use that, that functionality might need to change. Or maybe that is just a feature that's not important anymore. It's a reason to investigate. And it, what this, I think, enables is continuous cycles of improvement uh, for our organizations, for our products, you know, for our people as well. And I think that that's part of, I think all of these things are really valid. And, and, and I think what you're going to find out is, there's a whole lot that you can do. It's limited by our imaginations in terms of how we want to apply it and then having the, the wherewithal to figure out how to make sense of the data that we're getting. Um, I, I don't really have a question, but it's more an observation because I noticed that a lot of people are confused and they don't know what will come. And I have the idea that you, you were talking about something under the hood. I think that's a correct phrase because I think you guys came up with an engine and we all are people who are walking and biking, but we don't have cars yet. So they will be the people that will drive. So you have to create an engine, and I'm a vendor. So what we need to come up with is uh, inventions that will use that engine. So we need to invent a car, but we don't have driver's license yet. We don't have gas stations. We don't have roads, but they will be developed. And all these things will come to you, and then you can start driving. So the message, for, I think, right now is, there will be an opportunity to travel a lot faster. And in, in learning terms, we'll go from a tracking and tracing mechanism to a learning engine. And all you need to do is start dreaming, because you told you said that, what would be possible? And facilities will come. So I think that's sort of an observation. Hell yes. You have been so patient. <laughs> You've been so patient, I'm so sorry. I'm a horrible Phil Downey here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, let's see, two things. One, as instructional designers, I think um, for years we have uh, given uh, and requested uh, our, the learners to uh, uh, perform, go into the world, have experiences that are beyond what we could measure. And we say, look, uh, we can do these, here's a nice uh, multiple choice question, but really you need to go here and do this and um, uh, for to really learn uh, you know, what's, uh, what it feels like in the world and what, what's really involved and um, to characterize, um, to try a characterization of what uh, Tin um, is, is giving us is something to um, capture the uh, the fact or the, that these people have done this and perhaps bring it back to quantify it in ways that we may have previously put something in a portfolio. Okay, bring your, uh, write something, put it in the portfolio, I'll, I'll, I'll read it later, capture something, we'll put it there. Well now we, we can go in and quantify uh, with a larger set of learners in a way that maybe uh, uh, extends what a classroom teacher could do beyond that. Uh, so that's uh, right around this one characterization I've, I've been able to think of for this. Uh, the second part um, of two uh, is that um, I don't anticipate that uh, some of the larger LMSs would implement this very quickly. Um, I find that the larger LMSs don't implement anything very quickly, uh, even bug fixes. Um, and no insult there, it's, uh, these are large you know, systems, I understand. Um, but what I'm uh, anticipating is um, smaller satellite uh, LMSs or, or apps in combination that would work with an LMS. Let an LMS do what it does already and try to uh, develop some satellite uh, tools for handling that. So working in a large corporation, a lot of the feedback that we get is, how do I track things? How, it's got to go through the LMS to get tracking information. But you know what? Our business really doesn't care where the data comes from. They just want the data. And so uh, you know, I'm getting ready to implement something that uses the Experience API. And I'm going to get the data. And the business doesn't know if it comes from my LMS or if it comes from this company that's going to provide me the analytics on the back end. And it really doesn't matter to them. So I think that it gives us an opportunity to kind of get away from that idea that the only way we're ever going to get data is through the LMS. And it'll force the LMS companies and, and your organization to take a look at how you're getting data and why does it have to come from the LMS. What, Stephanie, what are you going to be pulling? What data? 
So I'm going to be using um, just, uh, it's basically an informal learning. I'm going to capture what they're doing to, um, we've got four main areas, continuous improvement, service, inclusion and diversity, and our performance drivers. And what activities are they doing to learn more about those in like a 70-20-10 model? So we've got some informal learning, but then we have learning from others. So what did I do to learn about our service commitment? through others, did I interview somebody, and we're going to capture those activities. I learned, I watched, I attended, using some of those, the basic verbs, and then we're going to be able to take a look at that and see what people are doing and having them share that information with others. So I can say, oh, you watched a video, I'm going to go watch that video, and now I've added that to my learning portfolio. Or, you know, I've talked to this person, now I'm sharing that experience, and I'm going to be able to come back to the business and say, here's all the activities they did, which I know are going on now. So I'm not creating any new learning experiences for them. I'm just capturing them and I'm showing the business. And I'm giving that person who's coming new to our organization and doesn't know how to start understanding our service commitment, I'm giving them some things that they can do. And basically, I'm just kind of helping facilitate that community of learning. Can you build like an app or something for people to capture that? Well, logistically, I'm going to um, use tapestry. Okay. Right. So, and, and, and you had somebody had asked about projects. How do you get this started? I'm starting with 25 people. And, you know, from that data, I'm going to be able to show them how it captured it. I'm not even going to tell them that it's this new experience API and how, you know, it's going to revolutionize how we learn. I'm just going to do it and, and have it be an experience. And on the back end, then we're going to talk about, okay, now okay, now I prove this to the business and it's going to put pressure on my IT guy to figure out how we're going to keep this up. Because once I, I know once I show it to them, this is exactly what they want to see. So um, it's self-reported self though, so people will be saying, I did this, I did that. Yeah, it's self-reported, but we're going to give them a listing of activities to start with to kind of seed that, and then I'm hoping that it'll just continue. But it's an experiment. I don't know what's going to happen to it. I, I, I know what I want the outcome to be, but you know we're going to see. But it's just another example of on the back end, they don't know that it's being fueled by tin can. And just one more question about that. So do you envision them like filling out a form if it's something that's not done with an electronic device? or? How are you going to capture it? That's what Tapestry does. Okay, gotcha. it, yeah. yeah, it's an app. It's a, actually, if you haven't used it, get experience using it, and that's how I got. That's how I thought about it for the business. Um, but it's you know, there's going to be more and more um, applications like this as vendors start using it. Use some of them. Get involved with their free trials and just you know use it and see what happens. It's going to be an experiment. It, and I think that, sorry, we'll jump back in questions, but I just want to talk about a little bit about use cases. I was talking to the Articulate Storyline guys yesterday, and I was saying, hey, you know, one of the things I'd really love to be able to do is for users to be able to kind of save out the information that they want to kind of capture from a course, for example. So if you're doing a course on sexual harassment training and you want to save out the definition of quid pro quo and you want to save these things out, that's the kind of thing that, that I want to be able to do with like a tin can call, too. So then you, the user could walk away with their own little customized job aid of the stuff that they kind of go, I want to hang on to that information or I want to hang on to that that idea or that piece. So that's that's a completely different, it's not necessarily reporting on experience, but it could also be used as a way for users to kind of capture things for their own purposes. Because right now, you know, if they want to go back, they've got to log back into the LMS and they've got to navigate to that page in the course to find that piece of information that they looked at and said, hey, that might be useful for me going forward. So you know, there's a lot of different use cases that we can start thinking about. And granted, you know, we need to, like I said, this is where we need to start kind of pushing pressure on other people to kind of afford this stuff so that I can have real flexibility about what, what that goes out to and how it gets aggregated and things like that. I know Clark wants to weigh in, but I know we have a couple more questions and, I, and the time is fleeting, so everybody's getting all excited now. Apparently the orange juice is kicking. Hi, um, I'm a developer, so I have a, I guess, a little bit more technical question. Uh, is Tin Can focusing more on the transport of the information, or does it help standardize the format of the information? Because you know, you guys talk about it being plumbing, which is about transport, but is it also about structuring the information? Because we're talking about capturing this information, all these activities, but is yeah. each LMS going to implement its own way of doing that, or is that going to help kind of standardize that capture, and then so other systems can use that information and understand it? 
really, really quickly and simply so that we can get to another question. It does both. All right. So we're talking about the transport of the information, but we're also talking about the format of that information. It is highly structured data and with extension mechanisms that can be very clearly defined and, and accessed in terms of like what that extension means and how you can validate that. Okay. The two many words are probably REST and JSON. Yes. That's probably what important clarification because some people get confused by it though. They can't not want to define the database schema or the database type by which a learning record store actually physically stores this stuff. It just defines how it comes in and out. A lot of people get confused with that. Okay. Um, so I have a question. I'm about to sit down and start designing a evidence-based learning portfolio um, with a view to portability of data. Um, part of this will be using, or the intention is to use the Experience API in that. I'm wondering if there's any comments on the portability of data using LRS, what security issues that might raise, especially if you're looking at um, portability, of, portability of data between countries. Do you want me to do this? Uh, I think the answer is, uh, I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're breaking a whole lot of new ground here. So in terms of the, the security issues and stuff like that, these are th oh, some of these are things that we can guess at. But there, even the things that we can guess at, there are no real clear answers that work for everybody. Um, and there's two ways to deal with that. One is that we don't do anything until we figure all that stuff out, and then we wait another 10 years and still get no closer. Or we just start doing stuff and we figure it out along the way in ways that make sense contextually, case by case. So, I really don't know. I don't have an answer for you on that. And I don't know that anybody else here is going to have that answer for, for you either. If I wanted to feed back into the community, then have I go through this journey? What's the best way for me to do that? Good question. If he wants to feed back some of this information into the general community, how would he best do that? Well, so there, there's a couple a couple ways that seem to be resonating really well. Uh, one, just in general, in terms of like how we're getting information around from everybody who wants to play in this space. Um, we at ADL hosts a, a couple of different mailing lists. One is for our adopters, who are people who are implementing uh, the specification in their tools or in content or, or in uh, back-end systems. Um, another one is for people who are interested in the specification itself and helping with that specification effort. Um, I believe that, uh, that the people, folks behind TCAN API have a LinkedIn group and they're starting to communicate there as well. I think a most, I think for me, most of the information that I get in terms of like who's doing what in the community is coming through Twitter on the Tin Can API hashtag, and pretty much anybody who blogs anything, I mean, there's a whole lot of people who are paying attention to that stuff. So I mean, those are ways to sort of start driving that communication in a couple different manners. And honestly, you know, we'd be happy to take your information and start exchanging cards because like that, this is a, the networking is really how it's been working pretty well so far. Yes. First off, this is a really great time to be in this industry because we have the ability to shape things the way that we really want them to be, and how awesome is that? Um, that being said, now that I'm going back to my organization and I go to talk to my stakeholders, how do I even explain this? How do I, you know, what literature is out there? What, um, how can I get them to understand? Bad Bloom's word, sorry. Um, you know, what this is and, and how it's important and start to prepare that they're going to have to make some changes, especially since we have a homegrown LMS. So there's going to be a lot of programming that has to happen in order to get that to be fixed. Self-serving. <laughs> Self-serving. So TinCanAPI.com, we've put a bunch of information out there, resources to help you understand TinCan and its impacts and all that kind of stuff. It's my, our company's personal website. So very self-serving, but lots of good resources out there. Come to Tin Can Alley, too. We've also got some literature you can, if you prefer paper. Same. Explains Tin Can. I, I would just print off a normal report that they always like and know, and then ask them what else they want to know about this data, and then say Tin Can might be able to help us do that. Other questions? I have one. Okay. Yeah, all right. No, you're rolling. Uh, this is probably a question that everyone's going to love. How do you get IT buy-in uh, to be able to want to change to go to uh, Tin Can and that? Because for 
one, traditionally IT departments say no a lot. And uh, so I don't think to do that. Like, you literally, my system uh, was implemented in 2002 and some total 7.2. They're on 15 versions higher now. Uh, we're moving there in 2015, which hopefully some total will be on Team Town by then. But uh, like, how do you get the IT people to change their mindset around Team Town? It might be just to play off of what she's saying is getting buy in from the executives, but it's uh, from an IT to IT. So I've kind of learned from the master. Um, I worked with Aaron and he taught me that if it's the right thing to do, you just figure out a way to do it. And so I'm like, I've had discussions with my IT people and they're not listening. And so, you know, I'm working the traditional ways. I'm going to bring in a consultant, but then I'm also just doing it and bypassing IT. And I'm going to force the business to create that case. So if I go back to the business and I work with customer service and I say, here's all the things that I got out of this. Is this what you want to do? And they're going to say yes. They're going to get on IT's pressure and they're going to cause IT to change. So I'm using all of my avenues and working around the system as best I can without, you know, I'm not the most popular person, but I know it's the right thing to do, and I know it'll get us where we need to go eventually. So I'm just working around the system. Learn from the master. I have no comment to that. <laughs> a, you had a question. <laughs> So when you talk about calls, I mean, we're we talking about making, or is TinCan really making this a full feedback loop between LMS and Course at this point? I mean, we're we talking about possibly making full personalization based on learning history record. I mean, are we getting to that that level where it's a full feedback loop? Um, short answer: Yes, it's certainly possible. It gives us the op option to do it. I'm going to take this opportunity to say the thing that's been finally coalescing in my brain that's burning me up is that. For the developer, the, you know, somebody was asking what are the different roles and what do they have to get on board, the developers start instrumenting everything. It's an opportunity to go much beyond just learning. To me, Experience API is about you know, track performance support, track activity in the social media system, because across all of that, the message for the manager is I'm now going to be able to start looking for correlations between this person touched this, did this and this, added this to the wiki, and that person succeeded. The manager's view is I'm going to have a lot more analytics. The way you sell to IT, if they're interested, buzzword bingo, big data, analytics. <laughs> the way you sell it to management, lots more information to find out what's working and what's not. For the designer, you know, I've been advocating all of you to, to continue to stop thinking just about the core, start thinking about performance sports, start thinking about informal learning and supporting that. But even just for your formal courses, to the, I want to get concrete about what I was suggesting because it, it didn't occur to me, but now we can start doing things like go out and take a picture of this. You know, Jane Bozarth has a wonderful case study of somebody going out and taking a picture. Um, you know, for your commitment to the customer, you can go out and take pictures of your facilities and come back and look. Do you have signs that say we welcome everyone or do you have a sign that says we you know, reserve the right to refuse service to everyone or anyone? You know, what's your culture? You, ha you can go out and, you know, Give a recommendation, go out and do a performance in public, do a flash mob, whatever it is. You can start prescribing a much richer suite of things and be able to track it. So as designers start thinking about a richer suite of opportunities to have people do things, go comment on this, go write a post. That's a very different thing than what Scrum can do and you now have those options in your repertoire. Again, developers instrument everything and managers start realizing you have this opportunity to start mining a much richer picture and looking for what works. We have time for one more question. This guy has his hand up. Sorry. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. So uh, one quick one quick request to the community and then a question. The, re the request is uh, just kind of an, ob an observation that since we're still trying to wrap our head around these, I think vendors are probably going to try to find their little competitive, unique value proposition to define new feature sets for their customers. Um, my request to vendors is to maybe start opening up customer feedback loops and actually actively soliciting your customers to find out, you know, if you're from 
an LMS group or something like that, ask your customers what feature sets they might be looking for and actually facilitate that community. For, the, uh, for all of us developers, if your vendor doesn't do that, maybe what we do is we start banding together into our own little crowdsource community groups and submit proposals to our respective vendors. So we go out on DevLearn, ask Calidus Cloud, I'm just picking on them, but Calidus Cloud maybe, and we post, if you're a customer, post a proposal, let's get together and do proposals for them. The question to you is then, um, is this just a, or do we just rolling this out through the learning community? Because it sounds to me that this is, there's a lot of analytics and information kind of stuff here. So it's probably not just a learning thing, in which case maybe it competes with Google Analytics and other analytics type formats and so on. Are we, is a community going out and rolling it out through other um, niches as well? Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. So a, a couple good points that I'll start at the end of is this just learning or is it bigger than learning? Um, we're starting in learning. It's a learning specific spec. It was actually based though on a non-learning specific spec. And so I'll spare all the technical details for this audience, but it's actually very well positioned to integrate with other things and complement them rather than compete with them. That's I think a really hopefully a really smart design decision for the long term as we start to branch outside of the learning domain. Uh, in response to your uh, comment about vendors and everything, going back to uh, a comment you made earlier about how this is a really exciting time, it's also a really crucial time. Um, vendors can adopt Tin Can in many ways. At its simplest, they can adopt it at what I call a SCORM parity level, which is, hey, we're going to support Tin Can to do all the same stuff we could do with SCORM, just with different plumbing. And that's probably where most of them are going to start, and that's great. But that doesn't get us where we want to go. You know, the, the most important takeaway, if I had one thing to ask from everybody in this audience, it would be to demand more. It would be to go to your vendors and say, here are the things I want to do. You damn well better let me do them. And only when paying customers who are actually using this stuff are demanding to be able to do these things will the tools emerge to support you. Yep. Julie, Stephanie, Mike, Clark, thank you all very much.